All right, Survivor fans, welcome to another episode, and allow me to introduce my guest today, Stephen Fishback. How you doing, sir? I'm great. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. How has uh, you know, your November been thus far, first weekend? Lovely. I mean, I live in Washington, D.C., and um, the summers here are absolutely brutal, which I'm discovering now. I'd certainly heard about uh, but November is beautiful. Like the, the heat is the heat is cooled off a little bit. You know, the the leaves are falling, a lot of leaves. Like they're falling all at once. But it's it's beautiful, and it's you know, I've got a two year old daughter. She loves like running through the dried leaves on the grass on the ground. Yeah, it feels very uh, you know idyllic. So you're not a hot weather guy, I take it. <laughs> no, I'm from Los Angeles originally, uh, where you know everyone, as everyone says, it's a dry heat. Um, and then most of my life has been sort of in the Northeast. So it's, you know, the, the summers can get nasty, but not like, not like this, like, in, you know, infested swamp that I live in now. How about yourself? Where are you from? I'm from New York and I'm such a cold weather guy, but you, you, you'll be surprised because over in our area, we always kind of catch like a heat wave during the summer. But yet so many people tell me I'm crazy when I say that I like the cold as opposed to the heat. But if I had to say, like, my nirvana would be October through March in terms of, like, a weather That's basis. Great. Sweater weather. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot more style to it. You know, as, like, a guy, I feel like when it gets really hot, I have very few options. You know, it's like, I can wear a t-shirt, but, like, that's that's pretty much it, you know. And there's very little to do, like, as a 43-year-old guy, you know, where I, I want to look, like, you know, presentable to the world. You know, and I, I just, like, you know, a t-shirt, it just doesn't feel right. But I, I but if it's super high, you know, what, what else am I going to do? Um, so so I, I feel very limited by that. But, yeah, in, in the fall and in the winter, you get a whole range. You get layer, sweaters, jackets. My God, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a fashion cornucopia. Yeah, th- there's so much more you could do with cold weather attire than hot weather. That's why when people kind oh, of yeah. their answers differ, I'm just kind of like, well, that's interesting. I don't know. I just think maybe people just like the the beach type stuff. You know, not many people are into the Hallmark type season. Um, and what? Where in New York are you from? Uh, Manhattan. Oh, nice. Okay. You said like my area of New York as though it was like some obscure corner rather than like the most famous area of New York. Yeah, no, uh, upstate New York is even colder than uh, Manhattan is. Yeah. So we're the Buffalo area and stuff like that, but. Sure, yeah. No, I, I used to live in Providence, which is, you know, okay. north, more, more north of New, in New England. And, um, yeah, the, winter, the winters were cold, but it was it was very uh, atmospheric. You know, you'd be walking down these houses with these old, you know, New England, like, rickety houses and the, the, the gray, bleak skies. It felt very uh, romantic. Yeah. Well, let me take you down the rabbit hole a little bit here. So, if I'm got the oh. timeline, if I got the timeline correct here, we're at I think a, over 14 years since your Survivor debut. I think I, I, is is the goal of this to to depress me? Are you trying to like send me into like a a spiral of of sadness? Uh, yeah, it's been about 14 years since I was on it. I, I like to bring up the years because a popular question when I ask my guests is depending on like their range of you know if they go to like you know, keep doing shows or they do a couple and then they just is to kind of get engaged, like their perspectives on if the timeline feels like yesterday or that the exact time of when it was. So coming off yeah. this, it does this feel like a long time. I mean, it feels, it feels like it, I mean, well, well now it feels like it's been my whole life, you know, because like I've been doing survivor things and been a survivor person, like basically ever since then, <laughs> you know, like I, podcast about the show i wrote about the show for many years you know i've i have a lot of friends who were on the show you know all of my tweeting is pretty much related to the show so for me it feels like you know this massive stage of my life that i'm still somewhat in and you know it's it does feel like a long time it feels probably even longer than 14 years you know it both at the same time like things that were farther away from that like, i mean i'm sorry it feels it feels much more much closer than things that happened even more recently than that. You know, so I, I can remember, you know, being in token sheens much more clearly than I can remember, you know, certain events in my life that happened in 2011 or 2012, which was, you know, a couple of years following token sheens. But at the same time, it, it also feels sort of like 
this whole period, it's like, this is like, I, did I ever, was I ever alive before, before I was on Survivor? You know, like, who was I as a person? You know, it had such a defining um, effect on me as a person. And then, you know, not just the show itself, but all the post show. And like I said, like the relationships I've made, the, the connections I've made. So it's, it's very, um, yeah, it feels both very recent, very present and also very far away. Was that always in your line of view to stay involved with covering the show? Like once you got a part of it, is that something that you had intentions on doing or would you say it organically fell in your lap? Yeah, it was definitely not something I intended. I, you know, in fact, like when you're on the show, you're like, yeah, these losers be from the past seasons, like move on with your lives. Um, and then, you know, and then it's you and you're like, oh man, I don't want to really move on with my life. No, no, I, yeah, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to, hold on, no, I'm going to a little bit. Um, the, um, it really did fall quite organically into my lap. You know, they reached out to me about um, people magazine reached out to me about covering the show for them. And so, you know, of course I came to survivor because I love games and I love strategy games and I wasn't interested in like the TV element of it. In fact, I almost felt I would like to play this game. I wish it weren't for a TV show because the, um, you know, you, you have to like go off and be interviewed while back at camp everybody is scheming and i'm like this is terrible you know i'm sitting here like who cares about this stupid interview stuff like i want to go be playing this game i want to be scheming i want to be strategizing um and so when i had the opportunity to write about it you know from a strategy point of view and a game point of view like that was very interesting to me because like that was the part of the game that really engaged me and that i was curious about and then following that you know rob um Cesternino, who has a you know a series of podcasts and you know invited me to podcast about the show with him regularly uh, as part of the Survivor Know It Alls, which is a post show podcast that he and I have been doing since Survivor Philippines, and uh, which was season twenty five. So you know, I think ten years ago, I think we just had our ten year anniversary, um, and that was just such a pleasure. It was so fun to watch the show. It was so fun to talk about it with someone who was so smart and so funny and had so many interesting things to say, <clears throat> and then. The other cool thing that's happened is that Rob has developed this huge um, community around his podcasts. So now I get to be a part of that through that podcast. So again, like I said, like it's sort of like become such a rich part of my life that it was not something I was ever expecting. It was not a path I, you know, deliberately steered towards, but it's something I really love and I really enjoy. Yeah, I think around the time of your original season when, you know, you first come off this thing, the means of covering the show or talking about the show hadn't yet even found its footing. You know what I mean? Like there was articles and stuff and you could write about the show, but I don't even think Twitter and Instagram had yet existed. You know what I mean? So like the means of like, I guess, marketing the show and like connecting with people to talk about the show hadn't even yet existed to where it probably wasn't even a thought that you could consistently talk about the show at that point. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't, I mean, like, someone from the show basically told me, that, like, invited me to be on Twitter. Like, it was, like, I actually think I joined, like, shortly after I was on Survivor. Um, so Twitter was, like, just, I mean, you know, just kind of getting rolling. And not at all, obviously, the Twitter of today, you know, who even knew what to tweet about back then. Um, I was just reminiscing with a friend because, you know, this whole, you know, question about, what's going to happen with verification you know and a friend of mine remarked that you know back in the day it was a total wild west there were a lot of fake twitter accounts happening and um there i remember it at the time there was like a fake jeff probst during when my season was airing who like revealed to all his twitter followers that you know spencer doom who was on my first season not not spencer bledsoe who's on my second season um and i had had a relationship while we were uh on survivor this was not true, but this was just like some random Twitter person calling himself Jeff Probst. And, you know, back then nobody knew. Like, okay, yeah, I guess that's Jeff Probst. That could be Jeff. Like, we have no way of, of uh, verifying that. Uh, but you're right that it was a very different environment. And, you know, it's funny. When I was on this show in Token Chains, you know, the ways now that I think people go, go on thinking about how they're going to build an audience from the show and I'm going to get more people to follow me on Instagram and, you know, people are like memeing and, you know, thinking of their personal brand. Like that was very different from when I was on Token Sheens where, you know, there was a few people who thought that they might, you know, launch a songwriting career or it might help their modeling. But they were, they were way more traditional avenues of like types of fame and it didn't really pan out because like that wasn't a path that was really available to reality TV contestants. 
in many ways, being on reality TV back then was a stigma. You know, it did not, it, it hurt your acting career. And I knew people who were aspiring actors coming off that show who had more trouble getting cast because, you know, suddenly they were, you know, so-and-so from Survivor rather than an anonymous face playing a part, right? Now, of course, I think that it pretty much only helps people in terms of their public persona. I don't think there's any real stigma. I mean, maybe there are certain careers where it would be perceived to be um, hurtful, you know, I don't know, like a serious career. <laughs> like if you were, I don't know, if you were an investment banker, would it hurt you if you were? I mean, maybe not. Like, you know, I'm so... Um, yeah, it definitely, ha you're absolutely right. It's definitely changed in terms of sort of the cultural cachet and kind of the 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 ways of connecting and the ways of talking about it. And you're right, the, the too, that like there just was not a lot of media around it. There was no podcast. You know, there were like radio, maybe there was one podcast or like one radio show about it, but, you know, not, a, not at all what it is today. Yeah, what, what about you? Did you... I guess, deal with any type of interactions, maybe with employers or anybody you just generally meet um, coming off this show, like that they would turn a blind eye to you because of your time on the show or they knew you were from it? No, I mean, it was really quite the opposite. You know, I think it, it helped distinguish me. You know, when I was applying for a job, you know, you really want to stand out in any pool. And then, you know, for me to say, oh, I was on Survivor. There's a lot of Survivor fans out there who are excited yeah. about it. Um, and then, you know, even if they're not a Survivor fan, it's an interesting thing to say. And then, you know, someone can say, oh, tell me about, you know, like, what did you learn? And I could share some deep personal learnings, you know, and suddenly it becomes it's a more interesting thing to say than, you know, like I've you know, learned from, you know, just just there, there's so many you know people who have very similar life experiences. So to be able to, like, be in an applicant pool and say, you know, I've done this cool thing here's an interesting thing i learned about myself in a way it doesn't seem corny it's not like you know i went to yoga class and i had like a breakthrough about my relationship with all humanity it's like oh i was actually doing this like crazy thing where i was suffering in the rain and like here's an interesting thing i learned about myself from that so i think that actually helped me um in terms of just like um, applying for jobs and you know I, I did a lot of consulting um and you know in, in terms of getting those gigs i think it really was was helpful for me yeah, not for nothing, too. Like, say, just for example, if somebody's trying to hire somebody for like a sales position, right? Like, kind of like marketing and stuff, they might actually be more <coughs> gravitated towards people that are on re quote unquote reality television because they might think that these people, you know, are good with talking and like, you know, marketing themselves and getting attention from people. I think now, for sure. I think now there's definitely, it can only be a positive, you know, unless, I mean, obviously the danger is that you go on the show and you're made to look like a fool. And that sort of happened to me my second time. You know, you can really, um, but not horribly so, but, you know, certainly some people have gone on and then they come out looking like absolute jerks and, and that hurts them in a way, you know, or, or if it doesn't actually hurt them, they perceive that it hurts them. So, um, you know, it is scary putting your professional career in the hands of producers and editors who are not looking out for your best interests. Yeah. But I think for the most part, it's probably a positive for most people. Yeah. What was the main thing from your second season um, that I guess stood out to you, I guess, that rubbed you the wrong way with how you're portrayed on the show? Because I did. I think I did read that your Cambodia, was it, uh, edit kind of stuck out like a sore thumb for you? Yeah. Um, you know, I got like pretty sick out there and, you know, I, I just generally didn't love, you know, <laughs> I'm not someone who is particularly suited for, you know, surviving in the outdoors. But, you know, for me, I was pushing myself. I was trying something hard that I was not good at. And I think now the show is better at really honoring that those people who are struggling, you know, like if you are pushing yourself to do something hard that is not, you are not good at, like, I think that is a noble thing. You know, I think that is something that is, you know, I don't want to say inspiring. I would never call myself inspiring, but I think it's like, I think it's, I think it's a good thing in one's life to push oneself to outside one's comfort zone to do things that are not, you're not good at. And, you know, I, I try to do that in my life and that's part of why I did Survivor. And I really respect it when other people do it. And now I think the show is very good at kind of highlighting those moments and, and showing, hey, like this person is struggling, they're having a hard time, but they are doing their best and they are really putting themselves out there. I got very sick my second time. And um, 
I didn't, you know, I felt like the show sort of like took that and made me look like goofy and gave me goofy music. And it didn't feel like they were, it felt like they were more like mocking me rather than kind of, um, you know, giving me a chance to sort of like, you know, sort of like express my, you know, human struggles. And I, I, I'm not, Again, like I think a lot of other people have had it much worse than I have in a way that I fo- have always found sort of distasteful, where the show is sort of like ridiculing its contestants rather than kind of embracing them and sort of celebrating them. And I, I do think they're much better at that now. I mean, some people would say they're too good at that, where <laughs> everyone is celebrated too much. Um, but I do think it's a nice change from when they really were trying to like, you know, they, they were trying to like kind of tear people down for for comedy i mean they were also i was like very sick i was like calling for the doctor and they were like, not giving me the doctor and i told the executive producer afterwards i was like i was like begging for a doctor and nobody was giving and he was like oh no that, that shouldn't be like we should have got you a doctor i was like well you tell me that now but like you know when i was out on the island like you could have got me a doctor like i was like really really sick i was like very, i was a little like oh no like am i going to be able to even like continue i, I was never going to quit but I, I was legitimately nervous that i was going to be pulled from the game was there a fallout from that in terms of like your health? Like when you got off that particular season, did you like, I mean, it's hard to say. It's a good question. Like I, you know, had a lot of joint issues subsequently. Um, it, you know, it's hard to say, like, was that from starving myself, you know, for two months, you know, twice, you know, going without nutrients at all. It could have had, it probably wasn't great for my body. You know, I also like lost a ton of muscle mass. Um, and having those sort of like weight fluctuations or the, you know, I've never really gotten back to the fitness that I had before I was on Survivor. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I would I'm still trade it, you know, I'm happier to be like skinnier and have had these incredible life experiences and gotten to play this game, amazing game twice. You know, I feel incredibly blessed um, for that. So, you know, and I maybe that didn't come across. Like, I definitely feel what I've paid and the challenges I faced from, you know, the, the difficulty of the show was was hugely outweighed by the blessings I got from the show. And my first time especially was just unmitigated, you know, in positivity, one of the great experiences of my life and really changed my life for the better in so many ways. So, you know, I, I have so much gratitude for Survivor. Mm. And, you know, I, I can you know say that there were things that I wish were different and that I was unhappy about. Um, but you know, you can, you can say that about any wonderful, you know, experience, you know, you can be like, Oh, my loved one is such a jerk sometimes, but still like they're the person I love the most. Now survivor is not necessarily the thing I love the most, but you know, I, I can both recognize, um, it's weak points as part of, you know, celebrating it's, it's, um, how wonderful it is. Yeah. Your season <clears throat> was the first one that you were on token chains was, was kind of a part of a three season stretch that I really enjoy of like Gabon, you guys. And then I think it was Samoa was the one after you guys. Those were like the yeah. first three seasons that kind of ingratiated me into the survivor. And, um, you guys just had such a compelling, uh, and polarizing simultaneously kind of cast and season. You know what I mean? Did you oh, notice? You. I- oh, oh go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you please. No, did you like notice like the reception change? I guess you could say from uh, first season to the second because I think like the first time around, you know, you had you and JT were kind of like the guys that everyone was rooting for, right? And wanted to see do well in the end. Like the two friends make it to the end, and then I, I, as you just alluded to, the second time around, you know, you had your personal struggles, and then the story and portrayal kind of took a turn a different way coming off that show. And sometimes, you know, the fans could either lean in the direction of the edit and be like, oh, wow, this guy's struggling. Like, what's wrong with him? Like, let's poke fun at this guy. Or they could feel bad for you. Like, did you notice the shift, I guess, in the reception from the first time around versus the second one? You know, it's funny. Like, the reception has even changed over time where, I mean, to both seasons, where coming off token sheens, First of all, now I feel like our season has somehow become one of those seasons where people are like, oh, I love token chains. It was such a great season, you know, such a classic format, 16 players, final two, you know, Tyson, coach, JT. Um, At the time, people did not feel that way. You know, it was like a lot of the fan response was, oh, this is sort of an average season. Like, it's kind of boring, sort of obvious that Steven and JT are going to win or they're going to get to the end. You know, coach is such a jerk. We hate coach. Um, So I think like, Token Chains has really benefited in from hindsight. So too my game in Token Chains. At the time, basically everything I heard in you know the media was um excuse me I don't know um was was oh Stephen's a follower he's a 
you know, oh, he's a weasel, like, he's going to betray his friend JT, how could he, what a monster, you know, oh my god, he's playing a strategic game and not a loyal game, and, you know, now, over, like, later, you know, 14 years later, it's really, like, my people are more appreciative of my game from Token Chains than they, they were when Token Chains first happened, um, and I think the reverse has, <laughs> or has happened with, uh, oh, no, 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 I mean, it's probably pretty much what happened with Cambodia, where... You know, you're right that I, the other thing about, you know, about, about, you know, fan response is that there's just a lot more avenues to hear fan response. And, you know, in terms of like you were saying earlier with, with Twitter and podcasts and, and Instagram and, you know, there's so many ways and it takes so much less effort for people to reach out to you now. You know, anyone can tweet me. It used to be. And the other thing is that you can't avoid it as well. You know, if you're on Twitter, someone could just tweet you out of the blue like, hey, I hate you. You're a loser, you know. And it used to be like I would go and seek out kind of the commentary. You know, when, when Token Chains was, was happening, I would have to go seek out a pot, uh, like a radio interview or I'd have to go seek out, you know, go to the Survivor Sucks message board where where Survivor was. That was really the only place where people were talking about Survivor in the with the level of specificity and analysis that people quite commonly talk about Survivor now. Um, and so. I could kind of gird myself when I went to those places, knowing I might not like what I what I heard. You know, now if I just like wake up and I'm tired and I check Twitter and like I have like ten people saying what a loser I am, and, you know, it's just like oh, I'm, I'm not ready for this. Like, I mean, you know, it's like, and it hits you harder as a result of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say you know the the fan response was um, sometimes quite hostile to me after after Cambodia, but, you know, I had a lot of people and certainly through the Rob, um, Sester Nino's survivor community who were so kind and so supportive and so wonderful. It was a hard time. I mean, I, it was, it was hard. It was hard for me to go on the show to be portrayed in a way that I did not feel was fair or representative. And then to have a lot of hostility coming at me, um, Right after the show, that's, you know, and over time it heals and like they move on to the next thing. And, you know, even like next week, they're like, oh, this is the, the new idiot. How could this idiot? But like, um, yeah, I mean, it was absolutely it was it was a challenging thing to go through. Mm -hmm. I, f I feel like you in particular, though, and I mean this in the, the kindest way, like you're just uh -oh. like a, a regular person. Like, I feel like you're someone that fans should be able to resonate with. You know what I mean? Like if they're watching and they'd be like, oh, you know, like he's somebody I could relate to you know what i mean like so i think like the maybe some hate that you potentially got seems to come from a left field sort of place i think when we watch these shows we all want the super like the superheroes though you know and, and when i watch like i'm get excited about like you know these like challenge beasts who are or or you know who are like you know doing you know killing it you know like and i think that's an exciting archetype to watch and i think because i was opposing those people that I maybe, you know, people were predisposed, you know, to to dislike me, you know, because oh, who's this ordinary human being who dare, you know, dare to suppose Joe, you know, Joe Anglin, the, the superhero. So, um, you know, and there were people who were rooting for me. You know, there were people who took my I mean, that's what's cool about reality TV generally is that, you know, the same per, you know, two, you know, you can two different people can watch the same thing and come to two totally different conclusions, you know? Yeah. And I really saw that with like, for example, my uh, back and forth with Andrew Savage in Cambodia, you know, there were some people who were like, who is this arrogant jerk Savage? That's like such a, you know, a blowhard and like poor fishback. And then there were people who was like, who is this loser weasel fishback, you know? And like, you know, trying to oppose, you know, great Savage over here. Um, and, you know, and Savage is, you know, so it, it's interesting how what's, what's cool about reality TV is how two different people can bring their own experiences. They can both watch the exact same thing and come away with hugely different um, perspectives on that, which is not something I think you could say about, you know, scripted TV where you're really kind of told this guy's the villain, this guy's the hero, you know, here's, Oh, he, now the, e even when it's like morally complex scripted TV, you know, the, the heroic person is doing something villainous, the villainous person is doing something heroic. You never really see different people just totally align with different, you know, different characters, you know, in, in that way. Or like, oh, I actually love, you know, um, the Boltons. You know, no one's going to be like, ah, the Boltons are the heroes of this story. Let's root for the Boltons. Um, you know, you're, you're always rooting for the Starks. Yeah, and something I always find so interesting about Survivor is despite having the reality TV tagline, 
it's sort of like a show that's set the groundwork for the new er reality TV genre, which is like the game show type reality. Because a show that I heavily cover is like The Challenge. And I feel like The Challenge, with the way they've shifted, has sort of tried to implement a little bit of a survivor type element to it. Um, and the th- difference between the two, though, is like The Challenge is more teetering on that line of living in a house sort of party actual reality type aspect with like social conversations and fighting whereas survivor is 90 percent game-based i would say is that a fair thing uh in terms of what they air you mean like they're not as much showing the sort of day-to-day stuff is what you're saying right yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it, it it really does focus on the game of it. I think you're you're right. That's sort of what you're saying, right? It's like much yeah. more about it being a strategic game, and you know, here's like a twist, and here's a an advantage, and it's much more about that. Yeah, I mean, you're you're, you're right about that. It really is like more of, and that was what always appealed to me was that it was a game. Um, and you know, I think when you're out there, you feel more acutely the the real life part of it. You know. For me, the things that were most meaningful to me about being on Survivor were those, you know, nights around the campfire where, you know, they're ba- – oh, I don't know how, how – did I just, like, get an emoji in front of my face? Did that happen? <laughs> that <Yeah>. was so weird. <laughs> that was very strange. I accidentally hit my space bar. Okay. Um, nights around the campfire where, you know, we're, like, swapping stories and – you know, especially my first season, because that first time you go out there, you have this just like huge feeling of discovery. You know, I really still remember that first moment where, you know, the, in token change, the trucks drive us off and they're like, OK, like. Go and you're like, go, I can go do anywhere. Like it's this, like this game is totally mine to explore. You know, there's rules for the game, but it, within those rules, I can do anything. You know, I can talk to anyone. I can vote out anybody. I can vote on anybody for any reason. You know, I can vote for someone to win for any reason. And it's just like that sense of complete openness and complete discovery. And I'm in this, you know, crazy area. I can go anywhere in that area. You know, I can go sleep down there. I can go over, you know, like, I don't know. It's like, it kind of like blew my mind to like be able to play a game on that scale with that level of freedom where the players are inventing basically the rules of the game as they go. You know, the players are deciding why they're voting someone out you know you don't have to vote someone out because they have the least victory points or whatever you vote someone out because they you don't trust them or they're weak in the challenges or you know you get to choose what matters and it was such a cool feeling of like total freedom um so i think like that experience of like the the personal i mean i guess i'm talking about the game aspect of it again (laughs) but you know i the you know, and, and, but then you're there, you know, what, what makes Survivor so interesting and so hard is that then you go and you sleep on the shelter and you're freezing cold and you're like shivering together and you're literally relying on these people for their body heat. And the next day you're, you know, blindsiding them and destroying their dreams. And it's that's what makes it such a powerful, compelling game. Yeah. What about the more like intricacies when it comes to like, I guess, being in that bubble of being filmed? Because I think with other reality shows there's sort of a game within the game for them. Like they kind of know where the cameras are, like what moments, like, okay, this is, this is the moment right here that they want. Like, and they kind of like play it up. Whereas survivor, you're playing like a literal game while also being filmed to to, like the cast members. How conscious are they maybe of the environment and like being filmed rather? Like, do do you notice like, at least when you were there that certain people would, be like okay this is most likely going to make air let me do this or did like people not even think about that i think i mean i did not particularly think about that and i'm sure that showed i'm sure that's why people you know um there's definitely people you know i was very much you know you know more self-deprecating more like who cares if they capture this like let's play this game and um you know, I think there's some people who are like, okay, I'm gonna like talk about myself as like the greatest strategist of all time, you know, whoever that might be. Um, and you know, I, I mean, I heard about Russell, you know, after the well, actually, you know, I actually remember this after we voted out Coach um, in Token Chains. You know, one of the producers being like, oh man, Coach is gonna just you know love watching himself back on camera. You know, he's gonna be such a big part of this this season. And I was like, 
oh yeah, it's on camera. That's right. Like you're recording this. <laughs> you know, there's like episodes. <laughs> um, I had like totally lost that. And I think that that has become, people are more, much more conscious about that now than they used to be because everything is filmed because everyone is so conscious of how am I going to look on Instagram? How am I going to, you know, what angle is, is my right is my good angle, you know, because people are so much more aware of that in their daily lives. I think they bring that awareness into survivor and you, know, you can see, you know, starting in kind of maybe the thirties, people memeing for the cameras, you know, people yeah. doing things that they knew were going to be turned into memes. I mean, the, the first one that I can really think of was Wentworth who in, in Cambodia was so, uh, you know, there were like memes where she was like stomping her foot to show her like stomping Terry or throwing Terry under the bus. And, and then, you know, you had Michaela and game and I mean, I think in game changers, like pretending to sip tea or no, she even like had yeah. a little teacup yeah. and she was sipping it at, you know, and that really has exploded. I think people are much more aware of that now than they used to be. I mean, truly in token chains, I forgot about the cameras, you know, and when the cameras were an, intru an annoying intrusion. In Cambodia, I was more aware of them, but like not so aware of them that I obviously was able to. I mean, in Cambodia, like I, I went out there thinking because I remember Boston Rob was always smiling in, in season 22. And I wanted to be like, and it, it was so much fun to watch him because he always had a big smile on his face. And so I really tried hard to always have a big smile on my face. And then at some point, one of the producers was like, why are you always grimacing? I think I was like, you know, I was like trying so hard. I was so unhappy. I was trying so hard to smile, <laughs> but I looked like just contorted and miserable. I think it's sort of a double-edged sword now with, I guess, social media playing such a heavy role because there's more of, like, I guess, a self-aware element to with how kind of cast members know the times that they're in and, like, what's going to, you know, pick up uh, likes and retweets on Twitter and what's going to be showcased on screen. But at the same time, you kind of lose a little bit of that, like, I guess, authentic luster that once made the show special. So I'm on the fence, I guess, when it comes to, like, the social media in reality game show i guess genre now but yeah i i don't like it i mean i liked it more when it when it was a little bit raw and people didn't you know weren't so polished you know I, and i do think that there's um i think that something is is missing you know with 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 people being so aware of of it you know at the same time you can't be aware all the time you know you're still starving you're still suffering I mean, in some ways, that's one of the disadvantages of the 26 day game, you know, in terms of the, them shortening it from 39 days, you know, you're able to, you're never really reaching your limit at that. Like for me, like, I only felt like the last week or so, like, oh my God. And, and I, I, I'm somewhat of two minds about that because I don't need to see people suffer. You know, like I don't, people don't need to like become emaciated skin and bones, you know, in order to like make good television. But there was something about this endurance challenge of of 39 days where it really was hard. And by day 18, you know, or 19, when you merged, you felt like you had really like, you know, you were you needed that merge feast, you know, and now they're like 12 days in, you know, they're like a week and a half you know, and they're merging. Um, and I, I don't like to be one of those, you know old man shakes the stick at a cloud kind of people who's who's you know oh in my day it was so much harder but it actually was much harder in my day technically yeah uh, <laughs> so yeah i mean and, and for the most part it doesn't really bother me but did that just happen again what am i doing um the uh, for the most part it, it doesn't really bother me but sometimes i think you know when people what makes Survivor good are though that is that rawness that people experience from deprivation, from sleeping in the rain for nights on end. And I, you know, no matter what Jeff says, oh, this is as hard as it's ever been. What is really hard about Survivor is just the length of time. It's how long you're starving. It's how long you're bored out of my, your mind. It's how long you're trapped on a beach with these people you hate. And I think that that, you know, something is lost from it being a shorter, a shorter time period. Mm. Yeah. Another thing I do enjoy about Survivor, it kind of seems like Jeff is like pretty hands on, I would say, like with the game and like just the more intricate details, you know, when it comes to casting. I mean, you know better than I would, but it seems like, you know, other game show hosts, like they kind of just, you know, si sign the check and then they show up for the filming aspects of it. Whereas it feels like Jeff actually cares a lot about like the season and like the game itself, then he has more of a uh, 
hands-on approach when it comes to it. Am I spot on with that, would you say? No, you're you're right. And I think, you know, Jeff gets a lot of crap from the fan community because, you know, he's he's the face of the show. And so when people are upset, you know, he's he's easy, he's an easy person to point a finger at. But um it's amazing how detail how he how in the weeds he is on on this show. You know, like most hosts just kind of like roll in, say their lines and roll out, you know. TJ yeah. on the challenge and like I love that's, the challenge and I love TJ. Like TJ's exactly. not like, you know, <laughs> what i wasn't gonna say it but that's exactly when i said signs the check and just shows up for the lines kind of totally yeah yeah, yeah 100 percent. i mean I, I think tj is so much fun he's such a great you know like you know nothing sadder in, in this world than when when tj just gets mad at, at someone for quitting you know when, when he gives someone a lecture but um jeff is so in the weeds you know and he is an executive producer for the show but like you know he could probably at his level of of um you know success he could be an executive producer and still kind of like float above it all. When I was on Cambodia, <coughs> excuse me, I um, they I got permission to blog for this show, and they were like, "Okay, Jeff's gonna read your blogs." And I was like, "Yeah, right." Like Jeff's got time to read my blogs. And I, every week I would submit my blog before the they were posted to CBS. Just you know, they wanted to read them over to make sure that I wasn't you know saying anything untoward. And I would literally get line edits from Jeff. Like Jeff was like line editing a blog about the show. Like that's how, you know, hands on he is in terms of like every detail needing to be right. Um, and I, I, that's just amazing. And I think what's so cool, what I loved about Jeff, especially my first season, um, was like Jeff really embraces the struggle of the contestants. You know, he takes it really, really seriously. You know, for him, it's not a joke or something light. Like he really you know, believes in the contestants and they're, you know, and, and wants them to succeed and like sees them struggling as humans. And I think that's something that's really cool. Um, and, you know, I think maybe it's gotten a little bit too much. Again, a lot of people are saying, oh, stop, you know, too much inspirational. You know, it's, it's too inspiring now. <laughs> stop inspiring yeah. us. Um, but I, I just like that as opposed to the alternative where, you know, you're just like, you know, a piece of meat coming through the, the reality grinder. I think, it, you know, I've, always would take Jeff, uh, you know, in, in that dichotomy. Mm -hmm. So do you keep an eye on the challenge or are you kind of just more of, I love the challenge. I haven't watched this season yet. just, cause I haven't had time, but I have watched all the, I stopped watching um, champs versus stars. Cause that was like, just <laughs> like not enjoyable, yeah. but um, I, I loved, I loved, um, I, I, yeah, I watched the challenge. I watched the challenge all stars on Paramount plus, um, you know, I, I, that's, that's honestly my favorite reality show because like, I mean, Survivor, I think is a better reality show, but for me, Survivor is like too, it's like intense emotionally to watch. And then I got a podcast about it and I used to blog. So it's like, it's not as escapist for me to watch Survivor in the way that, you know, I think about it. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to like probably meet that person. Like, you know, all my friends are talking about it. It's like, it is like, it occupies like almost like too big a space in my life. Whereas with the challenge, I can just like watch it while I'm working out and like, oh, like, isn't that like funny? I can kind of tune out sometimes. I don't need to watch every like dramatic blow up. Um, so I, I, I'm really, I really enjoy it. And I also feel like they're hitting their stride now where there was a few, like pr prior to Dirty 30, it was like too much with like too many, are you the one cast members and like too many like drunken fights with people screaming at each other. And I was like, yeah, I don't need to. And, like, and also like not enough challenges. Like they used to only have like, there, for a brief period of time, they were only sometimes having only like one challenge an episode, and I, I was annoyed by that. But now I feel like they're kind of like back in their groove. Yeah, I think what it was was Final Reckoning. If you remember, they, it was kind of a season that relied heavily on storyline and development and like less challenges. And I think that's what kind of prompted their shift into kind of what it currently is, where it's more like challenge based story second, if that makes sense now they're i don't remember if i i mean my my, my, my i used you know my, my memory i can like you know name every you know i, I know every survivor season the challenge it's all a blur you know <laughs> it's, it's all a blur yeah. um which which was which was final reckoning final reckoning was the season where ashley stole the million dollars at the end oh right 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 yeah 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 right so. i mean that was an interesting twist to that to that season but yeah you know twist ending that's another thing, too, I, I see with uh, reality fans. They're kind of on the fence about, like, what twist is too much twist, if that makes sense. Like, if you keep doing a twist too much, it almost doesn't become a twist anymore. Where are you kind of on the line? Because 
I mean, I probably pay more attention to uh, the challenge than I do Survivor. So I guess this is kind of like a tie-in question with like the current state of Survivor now. What is maybe your thought process on just the current direction of Survivor and just like, I guess, the elements of uh, having too many twists? Yeah, I think like there's a pretty firm consensus, you know, within the fan and, you know, Survivor analyst community where people think that it's just too much now. You know, I think it's, you know, and they, they have pulled back a lot from the thirties where it was just like, we, you know, we used to call it the Calvin ball era of survivor, but um, you know, it's hard. I like what, what excites me about survivor is people from different walks of life being forced to live together in extremely difficult circumstances and then forced to play this brutal strategy game against each other. So I love the strategy talk. I want to see more strategy conversations. I want to see more underhanded maneuvers. You know, that is exciting to me. You know, I want to see how a character's personal life ends up driving their strategy. Like, that's what's interesting to me. And I think that because there are not just so many twists, but so many unknown twists where the players don't even know what's going to happen in the next day. And like, maybe that makes for momentarily, you know, a more exciting TV moment, but I feel like it loses some of the substance of the show. And I also think, you know, I've talked about this with my co-host on the know-it-alls, Rob Sesternino, that players are playing more cautious games. They're playing more conservative games because they don't know what's next. You know, I think you have to have a little bit of, room to play you have to feel the ground is stable under your feet before you can make a big move or a big blindside and because there's this sense of well the ground could shift at any moment you kind of like cling more closely to your core alliance you know you 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 stay with the big group you stay with the stable alliance because you just don't know what crazy thing is going to happen next and i think that you know they need to i was talking last night um with pg law who's another former contestant and she was saying you know, what she has done with Werewolf, she kind of hosts Werewolf games. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot she's played in games where suddenly out of nowhere, like a new role has comes and there's like a new person with this new role that nobody even knows about. Like, that's not fun. That's not fun for anybody because like how, how could you play against that person? How could you have a strategy when there's just like a totally random thing that's going to happen? So, which, but, but at the same time, you want there to be some mystery. You don't want it to be everyone to know everything because that's boring too. So what she does is she has a sort of a chart of here are the possible roles. Here's what might happen this game. And then the players have the information that they need, you know, to plot out their games. They know what the possibilities are. They don't know which possibilities are going to manifest, but at least they have some sense of, of the possibilities. I mean, I remember trying to play against twists in token sheets when there were no twists you know the only twists that there were were a hidden idol and maybe a swap like that that was the whole range of possibilities and even so you still felt like okay this game could change at any moment you know i need to be ready at any moment things could shift and i need to be like prepared for that i mean i can't even imagine trying to play in today's era and and that's part of the reason i wouldn't play again is because it's it's just too much yeah it, it kind of ruins the gameplay aspect of it with uh making sort of bigger moves if people are more com- more inclined to play conservatively and then you also lose simultaneously the uh reactionary tv element to it because at what point does a twist even shock you anymore you lose that like authentic reaction if people are just expecting a twist at that point yeah that's absolutely right i mean the downs of the, the, the counter argument though is you know if you're not having any twists it could get stale and i think like now you know 2022 Compared to, you know, when I was in Token Chains in 2009, um, there's a lot more pressure on a TV show to stay exciting, right? Like back then, you know, you didn't have this huge range of streaming options. You know, now people have so many demands on their time, you know, not least of which t- is TikTok, right? Which is just like constantly moment by moment engaging you. Yeah. So Survivor has this huge pressure to be engaging. You know, to be constantly key, like, you know, you're, they have to like clamor hard now for their viewers' attention. And so, you know, I think there is, some, you know, you can't just air if you aired, you know, season nine now, like nobody would watch that. You know, you'd be like, it's so slow. You'd be bored out of your mind. I, I tried to watch season two a couple of years ago and it was so boring. <laughs> I mean, like, obviously, it's, it's iconic television and it was great to watch and I love the character development, but like, 
me sitting in that chair, like I was ready for something to happen. Um, <laughs> and you know, I just, uh, I think that's, that's, that's the challenge. I think that's the, that's the tension, you know, that's the, that's what makes it hard, and, you know, for, for them. Mm -hmm. I got to ask you about this guy because I've interviewed him before. And when I talk about just TV personalities, like he, he, it almost feels like this guy isn't real. Like he's real because I, I personally believe like he's authentic, but like just it just doesn't even feel like he's real. It feels like it's someone out of a cartoon, his coach. Um, from your like interaction upon like just meeting him for the first time in Token Sheens, like at what point did you immediately know like who he was, I guess you could say? In terms of the character that he was, I mean, I remember sitting next to Coach on the bus when we were. We, I mean, the 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 trip the trip to Token Chains was brutal. Like we got on a plane and then a bus and then a smaller bus and then a van. I mean, like, and Coach was he was huge. By the way, I don't think he's ever been that big. I mean, maybe I mean he's he's gotten pretty big again, but he was like huge at the time. Like, yeah. um, and he he probably, he probably lost a lot of weight. Uh, I think he did lose a lot of weight in in, in Token Chains, yeah. but he was like a big guy, and he was like sitting very proper and just like intense you know and focused and looking at people and you know it was just so much intensity in this guy and even then i was like wow this guy like, i was intimidated of him um out of the gate um and then i remember meeting him and really just like falling in love you know like he's such a fun sweet sincere guy who's enthusiastic about life you know and you know he was like giving people you know this like intense huge muscle leader guy and now he's like giving oh you're the wizard you're the warrior you're you know um uh, you know and it brought this like fun to the game that he didn't have didn't necessarily have and it really hadn't had that before right he was the guy who who did that you know he kind of like you know i'm sure there were there were alliance names before that right there were the four horsemen in fiji or whatever but like he kind of like brought this like fun mythic element to it and, you know, he was so earnest and so sincere. And, of course, like, and then there's, like, these, like, totally outlandish stories he's telling. Um, uh, but, like, I loved it. You know, I loved meeting him. I loved getting that that um, that part of that part of him. And, and, you know, like, some of these things he's saying, it's like, well, you know, if there was someone who kayaked on the Amazon and got kidnapped by, you know, a tribe of cannibals, like, Survivor probably would cast that person, you know, <laughs> like that probably yeah. would be someone they would want on their show. So it didn't seem totally far fetched. I mean, the things he was saying were far fetched and often felt unlikely. But you know, if that happened to someone, that would be the guy the way they'd want on Survivor. Yeah, I wish he won his final season. That that was the one that I wish he won. He played a great game. And, you know, I think he went too far with some of that religion stuff, you know, really. And and I think some of the, the mo but like, it is interesting that the people that voted um, for coach were all of coach's allies, right? Whereas the people who voted for Sophie were all of like the uh, enemies that they, they bested. So, um, or do I have that the other way around? No, I think, um, you, I think you got it. No, it was Savai that voted for, for Sophie to win largely. Right. I, I actually don't totally remember, but anyway, um, I mean, I, I mean, Sophie's a great, a great person. She's like a really good friend of mine, and, and I, you know, certainly can't, you know, fault her win. But, um, you know, Coach played such a, such a good, fun game that season, and it really would have been satisfying for him to win. But at the, you know, and that seemed like a, a really bitter jury too. I mean, it's interesting. It was an interesting game because, like, he also did some, some really shady stuff, like using religion to convince Brandon Hans to give up his idol. You know, like that's, uh, you know, maybe you know, you can see someone if they go too far, you know, having to pay for that. Like, that's a good dramatic narrative, right? Someone who crosses the line, then having to, you know, pay the consequences for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when you look at your original season, the personalities and characters that were on that. Like, I think anybody, if you were to pinpoint to the present time, you know, because we're having, like, all these crossovers of Survivor contestants <laughs> going on to the challenge now. I think if you would have told somebody originally at the time of token sheens like who's gonna be the person to like make the crossover to the challenge people would have immediately probably assumed like you or jt or coach but tyson ended up uh being the one to make that crossover. tyson's such a great and, and tyson's amazing i mean well also tyson was a professional athlete like if you were going to cast yeah. someone on the challenge like you might want to go with the yeah. professional athlete i could have seen jt doing it i honestly could still do see, see jt doing it i think he'd be a great character on the challenge mm -hmm. um because he's like so tough, so strong, says so much, like no quit in him. 
He's also obviously like brings great TV drama, as we saw every single time you've seen JT on the show. He's like, you know, always playing hard all the time. I, I even now, I mean, he's, he's not that. I mean, how old is he? He's probably in his, uh, you know, he's right. like not, I think it's like mid early thirties. I still think he yeah. or mid thirties. I th- I think he would still be a good character for the challenge, actually. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Tyson's an amazing TV character and a great, obviously a great competitor. I mean, he truly is the total package for a reality TV contestant. He's like mm-hmm. hilariously funny. He's an amazing athlete. He's very strategic. And, you know, he just gives great confessionals. And I think the thing that was holding him back in Token Sheens and, and his second season too was like, because he was so good, he got ahead of himself a little bit, you know, because he was such a dominant player. He kind of like started seeing too far ahead and was like, you know, calculating out to his win when he needed to get to the win, you know? Yeah. And and now that, you know, I think losing a couple times probably really helped that where, you know, then, then he could come back and really play with a little more patience. Um, and, you know, but like, you know, Token James Tyson was the guy to be, you know, Tyson was, and the fact that he, I mean, Tyson very well could have won out all of the immunity challenges. The, the, one, yeah. the one that we voted him out on was this crazy, it was a shuffleboard challenge in the rain, you know, so the pucks were slide, slipping and sliding all over the places. He still almost won. He was still like the number two in that challenge, you know? Um, and he was such a gifted athlete. I mean, everything, like slingshot, you know, everything he would do so well. Um, I mean, Tyson truly could, could have won out. I mean, I, I could easily have seen Tyson winning out um, that season. He probably would have smoked me on the one I won, um, which was the memory challenge. Um, you know, I, yeah, I like if he if we hadn't voted him out on shuffleboard, like he, you know maybe JT would have gotten him on the an endurance challenge where we all had to like hold our ourselves up. Um, but but uh, yeah, um, even in token teams, like I'm saying, like he was he was probably the dominant figure there, and like he went out a little bit early because we were like, Oh my God, we got to get this guy out. Like everybody loves him. You know, that's the other thing about him. Like he's, he's dominant physically. He's strategic. He's got all these qualities, but he's also like so kind and such a good guy and engages people so much as humans that like people love him, you know, everybody loves Tyson. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, I, he's a great competitor. Like I really hope he comes back for another season of the challenge. I, I've been like begging him to do it because I loved watching him so much. He was like, I mean, he really made that. I mean, that that was an absolute cluster at the end of that season. Um, but, you know, he really made it. Did, did you have any uh, close calls yourself as far as, like, you know, any other Survivor seasons that you almost went on to or maybe even any crossovers to other shows that you came close to doing? The closest – I was almost on Karamoan. I was in, like, the finals for Karamoan. I don't think they were ever going to cast me and Cochran, you know, on the same season. Yeah. Um, but – um, yeah, so I think I was like his alternate, <laughs> you know, if he got too bad a sunburn and had to be medically evacuated, they would ship me in. Um, but I really wanted to be on Caramon because a, a fans versus favorite season, like where you basically can eliminate half the players out of the gate and B, I knew all those people. Those were all my friends. You know, I felt like I would have done really well on that season. Um, I mean, probably for similar reasons that Cochran did well. Cause like he, you know, we were friends with Andrea. We were friends with Franny. You know, we, we knew, uh, we just knew everybody from, from, you know, I, I was really good friends with Corinne, you know, I, I, I knew Malcolm a little bit. Um, no, I didn't know Malcolm. Obviously I didn't know Malcolm. Nobody knew Malcolm. Um, that, um, you know, so like having and having those relationships and going out and being, Oh, I'm, I'm here on survivor with my friends. Like what a gift, you know, like that's incredible. And it's always the people who know the most people in all star seasons who do the best. Right. Like, I mean, you know, you look at survivor, uh, Cambodia and everyone at the end, everyone at the end was people who came in with a lot of pregame people from their season. You know, um, there were four people from Cagayan and two of them were sitting at the end. You know, there were th- three or four people from San Juan del Sur and, you know, the other, the other two final four were, were the two of them, you know, and, you know, Jeremy wasn't allied with Wentworth, but the fact that they were on the same season, I mean, they had, meant they had like some connection, right? I mean, yeah, all three of the people from San Juan del Sur, like Keith, cause Keith was, uh, was um, in the final five. So the fact that the final five were all people from seasons where there were a lot of people on their cast, like that's very telling, you know, yeah. um, in terms of like, and again, like Keith and, and Jeremy were never alive, but like you keep the people who you have kind of a working relationship with. You're familiar with them. You know them. And, and you know, Spencer and Tasha were like best allies in, in Congress. Of course they got to the end. I mean, I mean, so 
I still can't believe that I was like, oh, that, that's old news. You know, <laughs> what was wrong with me that I ever believed that that would not be, um, you know, a, a dominating force in, uh, in, in their second season. Um, but I think that still like really affects players, you know, and you know, we saw it in season 40, right. With Sarah and Tony, um, you know, it's just like, it's inevitable. Yeah. Could you, could you, uh, see yourself doing anything these days? Like any particular shows or seasons? Absolutely or not. I am done. I'm happy to be done. I have retired. Um, I'm, I'm much happier, you know, on this side of the, screen you know watching it i guess <laughs> watching it and tweeting about it and i you know um and also just like i'm 43 now you know like my joints my joints could not handle that i was i was struggling at 35 so <laughs> you know at 43 i'm not gonna i'm not uh not gonna to go maybe if they they implement like a commentator type role this uh at some point you know, <laughs> to take that on exactly but uh thank you again for hopping on here today. I had a fun time picking your brain and talking about some fun topics and um you know just thank you again. Oh this was time. so fun. Thank you so much for having me. I I really appreciate it. For sure. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks thanks so much. This was this was great.